that guy explain about the the area. <laughs> All right. I right, let's see if I can share my screen and we'll make this large. Now, can everyone see that? Yes. All right. Good. So I'm gonna <clears throat> I'm gonna talk about what I do in general uh, as, as a research topic, and that's dynamical systems and chaos in in fluid mechanics. And so dynamical systems, I maybe one of the best ways to introduce this talk would be to take that old Monty Python sketch and uh, with respect to what's just gone before and say, and now for something completely different. So um, this will this will be a, a different, very different kind of talk. So dynamical systems, what are they? Dynamics implies that that something is is moving. And what is that moving in fluids? You might think it we're 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 talking about stuff moving through. Um, through physical space, but really I want to introduce to you what uh, is called a phase space, and a phase space is a much richer structure than just the the real space coordinates that we normally look at. And I'm going to stick my neck out with an, to show an example about putting some chemistry up, uh, because I think a lot of people in this audience have a chemical background. I'm not going to explain this uh, the, the the chemistry here because I'm apt to get it wrong, and then that will just confuse you. I will tell you what this reaction does, this Belazov-Jabotinsky uh, reaction, and that's that it uh, it, it oscillates. Some some of the uh, uh, one of the compounds gets bigger and it turns blue, and then that sort of drops, and the other one gets bigger and it turns pale yellow again. Yeah, and this is I'm told this is a pretty easy experiment to set up in a beaker and watch this. This, this oscillation. So you can set up um, in re, um, instead of the, the 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 normal chemistry, you can set up these uh, rate equations about how the equation uh, about how the uh, chemical reaction will go. So you can transfer it here uh, because of what I found in the literature. This is the x, but these x, y, and z are all uh, concentrations of some chemical that's there in your beaker and they depend on rate constants and the concentrations of of other things and, and some other parameters like how much you're stirring and everything so you can translate this chemical reaction to these rate equations <clears throat> and now the phase space is just going to be uh plotting the the chemical concentration so here's here's one for uh the, the bromide and here's one for whatever that is and these are three the three chemical concentrations that are represented uh, by this. And, and for this oscillation, then what's moving is, is a point in now this, this phase space that might follow some of these curves depending on conditions <coughs> and, and where, you, where your initial conditions, what the initial concentrations uh, would be. And some of these will then change color over here and there'll be a different color over here. But that's what I mean by a phase space. And the, so the phase space can be any set of, of, of numbers that are important to what you're trying to investigate. And this is this chemical phase space is just one, one example. So then the chaos can come in um, from pictures like this. So here again, we have this phase space uh, been relabeled in these XYZ coordinates instead of the, instead of the chemical compounds. But that's, that's what this one means. And the thing I want to draw your attention to is, 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 is structures like this. Phase spaces, interesting phase spaces, have organizing, have organizing structures. In this case, uh, something comes in, spirals out, and then is re-injected. Re uh, that, that's for this particular uh, belazov jabotinsky reaction. And the chaos comes in when you change the parameters a little bit, and these organizing structures go from something regular like this that will give you an oscillation uh, to something like this, where the reinjection you know, just misses and then spirals out and comes in somewhere else, and what happens is that is that trajectories uh, that start out close together they can end up far apart and they lose they they lose memory of where they of where they started and where, what their near what their near neighbors are in this in this phase space. So what this would what you would see in your beaker for something like this, instead of this oscillation between uh, the, the pale yellow and a, and a dark blue color that's a regular oscillation, you, you would see like a random uh, interval that would stay yellow for a while and, and blue, and it would look like a random interval about when the changes would occur. 
but it's being controlled in this, if you put it into this phase space idea, it's being controlled by these, by these structures. And so that makes dynamical systems kind of a, a very rich uh, idea because you, these, these coordinates that these, uh, that these structures might be controlling your physics uh, in are, are, can be just about anything. And so how does this work for fluids? So in fluids, we have our own rate equations, and they're just they're just these. Uh, so this is what you might remember from physics. This is a could be a definition for the velocity. So this is the the x coordinate and the y coordinate, how they're changing, and the x velocity component and the y velocity component. If we just talk about x and y, you could have a z component down there. <coughs> but here in in fluids, our phase space really is a physical space. And these, these trajectories then are just like the trajectories in, in the chemical system, except now you can see them in those trajectories in real space. And, and the other thing that, that happens in fluids is that uh, they're volume preserving because they, you, unless you're talking about compressible fluids, which I will actually show an example of later, uh, then, then that puts a constraint uh, on, on the phase space. But these are the these are the sort of these are exactly equivalent to the rate equations that were in the chemical example uh, before. So let me show you an example of then how this works in a in a box of fluid. So we're going to take a an, an experiment, and this is this is the drawing of the experiment to explain it first. So we have a box of fluid here, and it's it's deep enough and set up so that basically uh, the the motion is just in in two dimensions. Uh, the wall of this box will move this way, and the wall over here moves this way. And if they both move at the same time with the same speed, then uh, you you get this this figure eight pattern here. And and this is called a hyperbolic point because you get contraction in two directions and expansion in in two directions. Uh, then is this controlling structure for this particular example. And so this is where I get out and show you the the actual uh, the actual experiment. And so that's just a repeat of this. And this is an experiment I I did quite a number of years ago. And you'll have please excuse me. Uh, right now I should have said that the blob of fluid started there. And there's the blob of fluid. This is an experiment. This is an old one. Uh, and like my knees, it's a little bit old and creaky. This video. But you can see the walls moving here, and it's drawing out these filaments, and the wall will move over here. And having them alternate in their movement then perturbs this controlling structure, this hyperbolic point in the middle. And now you start to see something interesting as the as as the as the filaments are drawn towards the hyperbolic point, say from here and then from here in the next phase, they're also folded, and now they're being stretched. And folded, and these then become the complex sets of trajectories, where a bit of the fluid that started near uh, another bit of the fluid now can be anywhere over here. And this also illustrates something in in, in phase space that you might have several of these uh, pictures. So you've got uh, fluid in here, just kind of rolls rolls around in a roll up here, and also down here. And this just goes on and on with these structures becoming more and more ramified. And this is also why chaos in fluids has, is associated often with mixing, because you're seeing these, these filaments spread out and, uh, and, and fill more of the space and then get close enough together that the fusion can then finalize their, their mixing if you wanted that. All right, so let's stop that and go back to, go back to this. <clears throat> and so this kind of experiment, if, 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 you, if you vary how long each of these walls moves, uh, you, can, you can get more coverage or less coverage uh, as, you stretch out these, as you stretch out these filaments. And that's all controlled by these, these hyperbolic points. Again, this is a special point that then controls all the other behavior in, in our phase phase, which is a, a real box of fluid here. <coughs> And so that's, in a nutshell, what, what dynamical systems and, and chaos has to do with transport within a, a fluid system. And so now I'd like to 
just move on update to what are we kind of doing now and mostly we're we're looking at this in environmental and biomedical uh, kind of transport and the the underlying themes are three dimensional chaos in two dimensions where uh, like I like in the experiment I just showed uh, these organizing structures are mostly uh, known and you can use them and we've used them in, in the past to design biomedical diagnostic devices, heat exchangers, uh, uh, mixer, industrial mixers. Uh, but in three dimensions or more, uh, not all of the organizing structures are, are known or understood uh, about how they actually work. So there's a lot, there's a richer set of, of dynamical structures uh, that one can investigate and use when you're talking about three dimensions and also three dimensions is well what the world really is not just two and also we have an, another branch about adding other physics onto this uh, uh, chaotic uh, fluid transport template uh, and I'll talk about two uh, where we add inertia and where the flow is through a poor elastic uh, medium <coughs> uh, where some surprising results have, have shown up uh, recently. So some things that might surprise you when you see them. So I'm not gonna talk too much about three dimensions except because because otherwise I'll be here for a long time. Uh, but I'll just why three dimensions, I, as I mentioned, I like this cartoon for that. Uh, day 44 still stranded with nothing but flat empty water. So the guy on the island. So in 2D, we understand most everything, but like in the cartoon, in once you start talking about 3D, you're you've got a lot going on, a lot more richer structure that can happen and that aren't fully understood. And so that's why we it's interesting to look at. There have been four PhD students, uh, you know, over the past over the past few years. Uh, Lauren Smith and Barath Ravu. Barath just uh, Lauren is. Uh, just started as an assistant professor in the math department at uh, the University of Auckland. Uh, Baroth has, has finished his PhD uh, at the beginning of last year, just before COVID struck. Uh, they did more abstract uh, kind, of, kind of flows where they in fact uh, each discovered a new mechanism for generating uh, uh, chaotic, chaotic trajectories in these flows and elucidated a, a, a good amount of the properties of those of those two mechanisms, uh, Trutesh uh, Bagara, he's he's doing a project uh, in the lungs down at the bottom of the lungs. Uh, there are these uh, there there's a lung duct, but at the bottom of the lung there's these little sacs called alveoli, where the gas exchange takes place. And we'd like to know uh, use the understand these structures in in these kind of in these kind of environments. Uh, then control the deposition of tiny particles that get down in the bottom of, of the lungs. And as, as we saw last month, and there was also uh, Devereaux Harvey here, who's looking at the, st uh, the structure around around reefs uh, in wave where the where the fluid motion is driven by by waves. And if and if anyone wants to know more than you probably ever want to know about this, there's a a, a review article that just came out last month that uh, is is uh, is voluminous. <laughs> It'll tell you more than you ever want to know about what's known. What I'd like to go into a little bit more detail about are two examples of, 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 of where we add other physics. So this is the way I kind of look at, at, at this, and maybe I'm a man with a hammer uh, because I'm looking at it, it this way, but I like to look at the chaotic flow template, as I call it. So these are various experiments where we've generated chaos in different, in different systems. With the other physics, and the way I look at the 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 idea flow here is you is I think the chaotic the kinematic flow template is is at the heart of everything. And then there's other physics, uh, buoyancy, interfacial tension, whatever that that goes and and combines with that. And that's how you that's how you get the, the analysis of whatever your application is. Is understanding that that physics. Other people might want to start outside and just release a computation, but or or an experiment. But I, I think for understanding things uh, at their at their most basic physics level, you you you've got to understand the the kinematic flow template that's behind this. 
So I'll start now where we add uh, not just passive particles that are fluid particles that simply move along with whatever the fluid does, but when the particles are small, they have some kind of small inertia, and so they can diverge uh, from the fluid. And this is this is work uh, that was done by uh, Robert Stewart and Stephen Wang. Stephen was a, a PhD student of mine, and I'm going to show you this movie here. Uh, because it's well worth seeing, because it's something you have not seen before, I'm guessing. <coughs> uh, this is a uh, this is just a, a tank, and it's got a rotating impeller inside of it. This one's rotating more slowly. This one's r rotating more fat, more uh, more quickly. Uh, this this Stokes number is a measure of the inertia. This, the particles inside are exactly the same. They're little. They're little uh, uh, plastic, little plastic balls, and the the extra inertia comes from up here. But what happens is you stir it faster. In this case, is you start to see these concentration of these particles, and after a little while, uh, you've you've seen that they've concentrated. So this is this is kind of this is kind of odd because it's like having your coffee cup, and if you stir it slowly, things things mix up and stay there. But if you stir it a little faster, all your all your cream comes undone and, and concentrates in a few parts of the flow. So that's that, that's a little puzzling, perhaps. It was puzzling it was puzzling to me the first time uh, that they 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 came and showed me the experiments. Uh, but it is possible to use these dynamical systems kind of ideas to uh, to get a handle on what's going on here, uh, so at, at low speeds, here's a here's a picture with the with the impeller kind of drawn in by hand. Here you can see it a bit clearer. This is the the uh, if you, it, at low speeds uh, you get these tubes that form above and below this impeller, and these are two different ways of visualizing them. This is a as a die that's been injected uh, basically inside the tube, and then the die is neutralized. Uh, everywhere else, so you only see the tube. Here, there's some uh, small particles that have uh, LEDs embedded in them that you can see the particle tracks. This is a little cartoon we'll use later about having these donut rolls, these donuts above and below this, this impeller. And don't focus on, on the equations so much. I only put this up here to, to introduce this this parameter because it'll be used in the next slide that's the payoff. So this parameter mu uh, is built from the ratio of the fluid density and the particle density. So it, it, it tells you whether the particle is neutrally buoyant or less buoyant or, or more dense or less dense than, than the fluid, whether it's gonna float or rise or whether it's neutrally buoyant. Uh, this one over here, the ST, the Stokes number, tells you how big the particle is uh, and with this Reynolds number, that's basically how fast the the uh, the, the fluid is moving around compared to to uh, to its vis to its viscosity. So the inertial ratio of inertial to viscous forces. And so this is the dynamical system that we're now going to use. It's an augmented one, which is easier to explain with this with this picture over here. So instead of having just these fluid space coordinates. Where, where we just have the X, Y, and Z of the fluid particles. We're gonna just take a, this plane and we'll call, even though it's a three-dimensional object, we'll write it in, in, in two dimensions so we can see it. But then we've got extra coordinates in our dynamical system that represent the particle, uh, the, the, the particle velocities. And the fluid velocities are all on this plane. The particle velocities can be on this plane, but they can be up here where they're when they're different than the fluid. And it turns out that you can you can show once you write down this dynamical system, <coughs> excuse me, uh, that there are repellers in this in this fluid plane. So particles will hit special regions and be ejected where they're into this part of the dynamical system. And what that means physically is that uh, it's it's a it's a part where the tra fluid trajectory is making a sharp bend. And like a car making a, trying to make a sharp corner but going too fast, the inertia of the particle moves it, moves it away from the, from the road, or in this case, away from being its trajectory being coincident 
with with a fluid trajectory. So it's it's the particle velocity and the fluid velocity become different. But soon that 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 goes away and 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 drag uh, it uh, makes the particle come back and then coincide with some some fluid trajectory in the, on this plane. So this is an attracting plane uh, in in this system. But what happens is that um, uh, what what happens is that sometimes the particle can follow the red trajectory and enter one of these tubes in physical space. Normally it can't it can't come in. Uh, these are what are called material surfaces. The material over here does not interact and come in here. You don't have any transport across that barrier. But in this dynamical system, from this direction, you do. So sometimes the particle will come in here in this tube, and it stays there because there are no repellers in that tube. Other times, it's attracted somewhere else. But eventually, because it's it's following a chaotic trajectory, eventually all the particles will hit some of these repellers, which are all over the place, and end up in tubes after a long enough time. And that's what's actually, and, and that turns out to be what's actually happening. If you go through the details, then you can get a criteria, which is which is this one. Uh, remember this this particle mu, which says about the, the the density ratio of the particle and the fluid, and its its size and its inertia. K is 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 a number that characterizes the kind of uh, shear stress that the impeller can get. It's it's a number you look up for each impeller, and so there are no fitting parameters here. These are, these are just the, uh, the the we've got the viscosity of the fluid in here. We've got the size and density of the particle in the fluid. We've got this number that characterizes whatever impeller we put in, uh, and that creates this curve in Reynolds number down here and this uh, this sort of inertial number up here. And these are the experimental results. At low Reynolds number, at low speeds of that impeller, we do not get any coalescence of these particles in, into, into the tubes. And as soon as we cross this boundary, and that's the filled in symbols, we get coalescence into that. And with no fitting parameters at all, the, the, the theory and the experiment line up really well. I, I like to emphasize that because that hardly ever happens. And it's, a, it's an amazing thing when it, when it does. Uh, so that's that's one example of using a dynamical system augmented uh, from the fluid, just the fluid dynamical system with these other physics forces, and to to explain and understand something that's that's it's kind of a surprising uh, feature in, in in this experiment. <clears throat> what uh, one of the other things we're looking at a lot is transport through porous media, and so. Porous media, you know, it's a rock or, or something with with holes in it. And the fluid can go through the hole. <clears throat> There's a lot of applications where uh, porous media is important. These are just three I picked it at random. This is a very complex uh, geophysical simulation of, from the oil and gas industry about a well and how to and fracking down there. Uh, Biological. This is brain tissue with uh, cerebral uh, with uh, with fluid. Uh, that flows through your brain. Uh, this is a metal foam being used as a as a heat exchanger, uh, as an industrial example. And yeah, there we go. So it, for porous media, at um, uh, when you want to take a representative volume uh, and average over the pores, because the, trying to trying to uh, uh, simulate uh, or measure what how the fluid is flowing through every single pore is is a very um, uh, it, it's difficult. In fact, it, it can hardly ever be done over a large over a large space. Um, so, if you average over the pore volume, it's been known for a long time that you get something called Darcy flow uh, in its simplicity. So the 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 fluid the flux of fluid is the gradient of a pressure. Uh, and this spatially heterogeneous hydraulic conductivity. And that represents that you would have narrower pores or fewer pores in some place. So the conductivity is, is gets low, uh, or you've got lots of pores and they're very open uh, in other places and the conductivity gets high. And so you get more fluid flow where, there, where there's less resistance 
and less fluid flow where there's more resistance. Resistance would be the inverse of the conductivity here. So this is what's called a potential flow because of this gradient of the pressure is uh, is generating the uh, the flow. And there's a few things uh, to know about uh, about these special potential flows in that most of the time people uh, think that they're dull. <coughs> uh, so this is just a, uh, a a box of 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 a porous media with a fluid flowing across it. There's a higher pressure here. There's a lower pressure here. A bunch of points are started off here, and they just they flow through. But for steady these isotropic steady flows, it's known you can show exactly that they cannot mix. There's no vorticity. These flow lines can't cross. They're helicity free, and and maybe strangely, uh, it's exactly the same for 3D. So the steady porous media flows are quite dull, but you can see things in, uh, like in uh, in mining, the thickness of veins, things where things have reacted, and and diffusion alone cannot have uh, created something that thick in the time it's left uh, that that contradict that this, and there's something else must be going on. And so more general Darcy flows, it turns out, can mix. Um, I, I'm not going to talk about anisotropic, uh, but you, you can make them so that the conductivity has very special, has a very special structure. Um, <clears throat> so just purely time dependent uh, Darcy flows, all you, you can you can arrange them such that you can engineer the time dependence in such a way that it, it will mix. And we've used that uh, to, to generate some, uh, some um, contaminant cleanup uh, approaches. And this was recently, uh, about uh, the beginning of last year, uh, verified in the thesis of Ms. Michelle Cho uh, at the University of Waterloo, where she did a field experiment in Canada uh, and we had predicted certain protocols where she could drill wells and turn on one and then the other in a particular order. And she used a, a, a very clever uh, resistive tomography uh, uh, measurement to, to measure this, this concentration of salt water that she had uh, put down. And it follows what we predicted quite well. And that's so an engineered porous media where you can engineer some time dependence. We we know we can get things to mix and generate chaos. In uh, but I'd like to show you an example now about a natural system. And in a natural system, uh, say an aquifer that has a tidal boundary where you have an oscillating pressure, that's not enough to generate chaos. But if you have some poroelasticity, something where your uh, compressibility in your porous matrix that will break this this symmetry. Uh, along these flow lines, and then you can get some interesting and unexpected behavior to, to occur. So this this is uh, what we've been what we've been looking at. This again is a box of porous media. The background color is this uh, this conductivity, uh, and this particular one is. Uh, I won't tell you how you generate these things, but you can generate them in a variety of ways. But you get you get. Uh, high conductivity areas and low conductivity areas and, and, and lots of lots of things in between. Uh, we've got a pressure over here uh, that's that's that, that's uh, we're, we're it's supposed to be a very very simplified model of an aquifer that's near the beach. So you've got some uh, some some pressure from the land that's pushing things this way, and you've got the tides that come up on this side and give an oscillating pressure. Uh, oh, on on this side, you have we, we put a no flow over here just to make our box simple. Now we make this compressible by looking at a por in the simplest possible way by looking at a porosity. That's the phi here is is a is a is a set value uh, for the normal pressure, uh, and then when the pressure rises over here, the porosity the the, the porosity increases. So. Uh, and when it drops, it it, it it goes down. So the the porosity here will will oscillate in different ways, and that's controlled by this coefficient s, which in the uh, hydraulics uh, community is known as a is a storativity. 
and I won't go over the, the equations, but when you add those two things together, heterogeneity and compressibility, uh, you, you start to get uh, some things like this. And so these are a set, that's the same box of porous media with the, the same setup pressure over here, oscillating pressure over here. <coughs> a set of a set of trajectories that start over here and move this way. We'll focus on this little box. And if you have no compressibility, then you 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 have the steady flow behavior. You just have the, these these trajectories that start here, they stay in the same order. Uh, during the oscillation, things just move across the flow back and forth in the flow line, and the steady pressure moves them moves them forward. So you have this sort of back and forth with a little ratchet that moves. But when you turn on the compressibility, now they can make these loops. These these are called braided structures, and they can be the analyzed with things called mathematical braids, if you like. But the reality is it, it mixes up. Things come in in this order, things in, leave in that order. And you can see there are regions around here where you get a lot of this mixing as long as you have uh, these, these kind of uh, compressibility and heterogeneity are the two things that, are, that matter. And these have real, uh, uh, at least in the computer, <laughs> these, these have structures that we've seen before. And so you can get these isolated regions uh, like here or here or up in here, where fluid is trapped, fluid that stays in there is trapped. Other fluid gets mixed around. Uh, you you have you you have exit zones that now are uh, trapped. That now are trapped. Nothing will leave through some of these exit zones, and that's from from the manifold, some other special uh, uh, lines and structures that are generated uh, in here. Uh, this is a residence time distribution at the exit boundary. And so the blue in the background is the, the time it takes for a line of particles that start that start back here to exit. <coughs> there it goes. If you don't have if you don't have any uh, the, the blue is with no compressibility and the black is with compressibility. So you get a very big change. You get places that are excluded, and this is interesting because people can actually observe these exclusion zones where nothing comes out and things only come in uh, on on actual tidal aquifers that can be measured. You have these this, these mixing zones where things become well mixed as as they as they come out, and we have where they go, and we have then these these structures that we see ubiquitously in planar chaotic systems where you've got a regular zone. Where, where fluid is, is trapped, and you've got these stochastic mixing zones, and things can come in from the outer boundary, mix with things in here, and then leave through that boundary. Perhaps even more surprising is without this regional gradient, without having a, a pressure gradient across it, it, but just having the oscillating pressure gradient, uh, so you've got no net mass flux through here, you can still generate motion, and it's quite interesting motion. Uh, so this is then uh, these little loops are the oscillations from that, and the black lines are just a point that's put down at the end of every oscillation. And so you do get this drifting motion. Uh, so you've got this fast motion from the loops and this slower drift where it moves just a little bit every period. And that's that was a sequence that was a from a larger set, but now we start to, when we pull out and look at a larger section of this, you see more and more structures. In fact, this is very much reminiscent of the, uh, of the, uh, of, of the figure eight I showed in the original fluid e example. These little blue lines are these fast, again, these oscillations, but at the end of every period, the black dots that are put down are forming these, are forming these structures. And I, four yeah, more minutes. Four more. You're so that, it's, per, so. it's perfect. I am right. I am right at the end. I will. I will be done. <laughs> and this rather lurid photo then is our entire box of fluid with a whole grid of points put down with random colors. And you can see there's these these structures. That's the one I showed in the in the in the last figure. 
uh, those kind of structures with islands and these kind of things with mixed jets uh, in between them are just shot through the entire focus. And so there, while there's no net mass flux uh, from just this oscillating boundary to driving everything, you have zones, big zones where mass comes in, flows around, and, and, then, and then comes out, but they're, of course, in balance. And so this is a puzzling behavior that uh, we, that I'll, I'll skip that then since we're right at the end. So some of these questions about drift that we're still puzzling out is that it's puzzling about why this happens. So it must come from the symmetry breaking of, of these flow lines that's introduced by compressibility. Because this is the only thing that required for this is that you've got compressibility on, and this heterogeneity. You need both of those things uh, to, to make this kind of drift. But how exactly to describe this mathematically and then predict what kind you, what, what the drift would be with, from material properties, just from the conductivity field and how it's being driven, for instance, those are things we're still puzzling about. And if it's heterogeneity and compressibility are all that matter to generate this, then this kind of drift should appear in more realistic poroelastic models, and in fact, in, in, in poroelastic, uh, in, in real poroelastic materials like, like brain tissue. Uh, and it would be kind of exciting to then extend this to see if that's really true. And of course, can we make an experiment to, to visualize and measure this, this kind of drift? So those are some of the questions about this latest research that we're, that, that we're puzzling over. Uh, and with that, I will just say thanks for listening. And happy to take any, any questions. Thank you. Yeah, I told you I'd finish it on time. There you go. Where, now, where the, uh, how do I unshare? Where's the thing that shit lets me unshare? So, Stop sharing. Yeah. <laughs> Have I stopped sharing? Yes. So, <laughs> oh, any fine. questions? Yes, Maybe I have one. Yeah, Jeff. <laughs> I'm very intrigued by your impeller that creates these two rings of concentrated particles. Yes. So, you, in molten metal processing, you've uh, you're always worrying about oxides and intermetallic particles and things, and usually you have to have to leave your melt either for a long time so that they all sink to the bottom or float to the top, or you have to filter, which is is has its own problems. Mm -hmm. So can you design a system where the you run your impeller and all the oxides and intermetallic particles in the melt go into these rings, cleaning up the rest of it? Uh, possibly. Uh, you, you can certainly move those those rings around depending on where you put the impeller. Uh, so we've, we, we uh, Stephen did another experiment where he put the impeller near the bottom so the ring, there was only the top ring above the impeller and sucked all the particles into that and then put a hose in and, and, and pulled out clean fluid to show mm -hmm. that, yes, you, you know, in a crude way that, yes, you can make a separation device. And so it would depend on the, uh, wh whether it was feasible would depend on the, the Reynolds number of the liquid mm -hmm. metal in, in, in the vat and the inertia, the, the, the size and properties of the particles you'd like to clean. Mm. Uh, now, one of the, one of the things uh, is, 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 is that you can, you can also selectively get out um, because, of, because of the way that, that curve works. Uh, if, if you turn up your Reynolds number, you're going to get a certain size or certain mm. inertial particle that is sucked in first. Mm. And, it's then, a, it's, and it's, then bigger, then bigger and bigger ones, uh, more and more inertial get sucked up a, as you a, a, as you change the Reynolds number. So it's amazingly it, uh, counterintuitive. It, it, it is really quite counterintuitive. I I made them show me the physical experiment, not the not the video when they first showed it to me. I can imagine <laughs> going to my plant people and telling them. I've got this great idea to separate your oxides. Just stir them up. <laughs> stir harder. <laughs> stir, go, up, stir a little bit harder. And that might be it. it I don't know what kind of well, numbers there are in, in, in those so, metal processing. It, it may be that the Reynolds numbers are high enough that, it, because if you turn the Reynolds number up, the stirring up enough, um, it becomes turbulent. And those, those tubes, those donut tubes that trap these particles, they break up. Yeah. 
Yeah, so you, you you would have to have it in in the right in the right space. But you, yeah, sure. What 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 was the rotation speed in the impeller size? Uh, uh, well, the, the the tank was the tank for that one was a was a desktop, and the the uh, was a desktop. So I mean, I'm, you can't tell what I'm when I'm going with my hands. This is the bad thing about Zoom. <laughs> but it was, it was like a hundred centimeters tall and. Uh, well, maybe it was 100 centimeters wide and 200 tall. I I I forget mm. exactly, but it fit on the on the lab bench quite easily. And uh, the low ones there was tens of was tens of revolutions when it didn't when it didn't trap, and it was all oh, more more than that hundreds when it did trap. And if you put it up to 500 revolutions, everything. Fell apart. Yeah, because the the aluminium ones, the inline ones, where they do the um, argon injection to remove hydrogen, they also the bubbles connect to the inclusions and they get floated out of the system mm -hmm. as well. But they're running generally around 200 p rpm, um, and they're they're slightly bigger than your box. They're but big. Not, yeah, but no, they're not that big. Um, they're sort of I don't know. Say two meters square, uh, two meters by two meters by. Some of them are only they're less than a meter deep, so it's, not, it's, it's quite a similar system. Yeah, well, we ha we have a system for making master alloys with mm. just stirring molten magnesium, and we're trying to mix up the the thing we're adding, and uh, the scale is close to fairly close to what you're talking about. A little bit bigger, but not so huge. Mm. I wonder if it's worth you could you. I mean, there's a there's a desktop exercise we could do to calculate if it's possible. What will we need? Yeah, we we could take the uh, we, we we have the <coughs> we we have those uh, equations. Uh, yeah. uh, we we could make them. We use that to make an estimate. Yeah, uh, then we could um we could an try actual, um, an actual it... computation an actual computation of the thing in the tank. With a moving mesh for the impeller and all that, mm. that's a you, you'll you'll need a grad student you'll need a grad student that's pretty competent in CFD for that. But uh, mm. we'd, we'd want to get a rough idea, and then we would because unfortunately you can't see inside the metal without a synchrotron. It, <laughs> and, uh, indeed, the, uh, we would you know you could try in the regime you know like get some dirty metal and um, and see if we have an effect. There, there has has been studies uh, the. Uh